King Solomon's Mines by H. Ryder Haggard Chapter 2 The Legend of Solomon's Mines "'What was it that you heard about my brother's journey at Bamangwato?' asked Sir Henry, as I paused to fill my pipe before replying to Captain Good. "'I heard this,' I answered, "'and I have never mentioned it to a soul till today. "'I heard that he was starting for Solomon's Mines.' "'Solomon's Mines?' ejaculated both my hearers at once. "'Where are they?' "'I don't know,' I said. "'I know where they are said to be. "'Once I saw the peaks of the mountains that border them, "'but there were a hundred and thirty miles of desert between me and them, "'and I am not aware that any white man ever got across it save one. "'But perhaps the best thing I can do is tell you the legend of Solomon's Mines as I know it, you passing your word not to reveal anything I tell you without asking my permission. Do you agree to that? I have my reasons for asking. Sir Henry nodded, and Captain Good replied, Certainly, certainly. Well, I began, as you may guess, generally speaking, elephant hunters are a rough set of men, who do not always trouble themselves with much beyond the facts of life and the ways of kaffirs. But here and there you meet a man who takes the trouble to collect traditions from the natives and tries to make out a little piece of the history of this dark land. It was such a man as this who first told me the legend of Solomon's Mines, now a matter of nearly thirty years ago. That was when I was on my first elephant hunt in the Matalebe country. His name was Evans, and he was killed the following year, poor fellow, by a wounded buffalo, and lies buried near the Zambezi Falls. I was telling Evans one night, I remember, of some wonderful workings I had found whilst hunting Kuru and Iland in what is now the Leidenberg district of the Transvaal. I see they have come across these workings again lately in prospecting for gold, but I knew of them years ago. There is a great wide wagon road cut out of the solid rock and leading to the mouth of the working or gallery. Inside the mouth of this gallery are stacks of gold quartz piled up ready for roasting, which shows that the workers, whoever they were, must have left in a hurry. Also, about twenty paces in, the gallery is built across, and a beautiful bit of masonry it is. I said Evans, but I will spin you a queerer yarn than that. And he went on to tell me how he had found in the far interior a ruined city, which he believed to be the Ophir of the Bible. And by the way, other more learned men have said the same long since poor Evans' time. I was, I remember, listening open-eared to all these wonders, for I was young at the time, and this story of an ancient civilization and of the treasures which those old Jewish or Phoenician adventurers used to extract from a country long since lapsed into the darkest barbarism took a great hold upon my imagination, when suddenly he said to me, "'Lad, did you ever hear of the Suleiman Mountains?' up to the northwest of the Mushakulumbwe country. I told him I never had. Ah, well, he said, that is where Solomon really had his mines, his diamond mines, I mean. How do you know that, I ask? Know it? Why, what is Suleiman but a corruption of Solomon? Suleiman is the Arabic form of Solomon, editor's note. Besides, an old Isanosi, or witch doctoress, up in the Manika country told me all about it. She said that the people who lived across those mountains were a branch of the Zulus, speaking a dialect of Zulu, but finer and bigger men even, that there lived among them great wizards who had learnt their art from white men when 
all the world was dark, and who had the secret of a wonderful mine of bright stones. Well, I laughed at the story at the time, though it interested me, for the diamond fields were not discovered then. But poor Evans went off and was killed, and for twenty years I never thought any more of the matter. However, just twenty years afterwards, and that is a long time, gentlemen, an elephant hunter does not often live for twenty years at his business, I heard something more definite about Suleiman's mountains and the country which lies beyond them. I was up beyond the Manika country at a place called Sitanda's Kral, and a miserable place it was, for a man could get nothing to eat, and there was but little game about. I had an attack of fever and was in a bad way generally, when one day a Portuguese arrived with a single companion, a half-breed. Now, I know your low-class de lago Portuguese well. There is no greater devil unhung in a general way, battening as he does upon human agony and flesh in the shape of slaves. But this was quite a different type of man to the mean fellows whom I had been accustomed to meet. Indeed, in appearance, he reminded me more of the polite doms I have read about, for he was tall and thin, with large dark eyes and curling gray mustachios. We talked together for a while, for he could speak broken English, and I understood a little Portuguese, and he told me that his name was José Silvestre, and that he had a place near De Lagoa Bay. When he went on next day with his half-breed companion, he said goodbye, taking off his hat quite in the old style. Goodbye, senor, he said. If we ever meet again, I shall be the richest man in the world, and I will remember you. I laughed a little. I was too weak to laugh much, and watched him strike out for the great desert to the west, wondering if he was mad or what he thought he was going to find there. A week passed, and I got the better of my fever. One evening I was sitting on the ground in front of the little tent I had with me, chewing the last leg of a miserable fowl I had bought from a native for a bit of cloth worth twenty fowls, and staring at the hot red sun sinking down over the desert, when suddenly I saw a figure, apparently that of a European, for it wore a coat. "'on the slope of the rising ground opposite to me, "'about three hundred yards away. "'The figure crept along on its hands and knees, "'then it got up and staggered forward a few yards on its legs, "'only to fall and crawl again. "'Seeing that it must be somebody in distress, "'I sent one of my hunters to help him, "'and presently he arrived, "'and who do you suppose it turned out to be?' "'Jose Silvestre, of course,' said Captain Good. "'Yes, Jose Silvestre, or rather his skeleton and a little skin. "'His face was a bright yellow with bilious fever, "'and his large dark eyes stood nearly out of his head, "'for all the flesh had gone. "'There was nothing but yellow parchment-like skin, "'white hair, and the gaunt bones sticking up beneath.' "'Water, for the sake of Christ, water!' he moaned. "'And I saw that his lips were cracked, "'and his tongue, which protruded between them, "'was swollen and blackish. "'I gave him water with a little milk in it, "'and he drank it in great gulps, two quarts or so, without stopping. "'I would not let him have any more. "'Then the fever took him again, "'and he fell down and began to rave about Suleiman's mountains.' and the diamonds, and the desert. I carried him into the tent, and did what I could for him, which was little enough, but I saw how it must end. About eleven o'clock he grew quieter, and I lay down for a little rest and went to sleep. At dawn I woke again, and in the half-light saw Sylvester sitting up, a strange gaunt form, and gazing out towards the desert. Presently the first ray of the sun shot right across the wide plain before us till it reached the far away crest of one of the tallest of the Suleiman Mountains more than a hundred miles away. There it is, cried the dying man in Portuguese, 
and pointing with his long, thin arm. But I shall never reach it, never. No one will ever reach it. Suddenly he paused and seemed to take a resolution. Friend, he said, turning towards me, are you there? My eyes grow dark. Yes, I said, yes, lie down now and rest. Ay, he answered, I shall rest soon. I have time to rest all eternity. Listen, I am dying. You have been good to me. I will pass you the writing. Perhaps you will get there if you can live to pass the desert, which has killed my poor servant and me. Then he groped in his shirt and brought out what I thought was a boar tobacco pouch made of the skin of the swartvet pens or sable antelope. It was fastened with a little strip of hide, what we call a rimpi, and this he tried to loose, but could not. He handed it to me. Untie it, he said. I did so, and extracted a bit of torn yellow linen on which something was written in rusty letters. Inside this rag was a paper. Then he went on feebly, for he was growing weak. The paper has all that is on the linen. It took me years to read. Listen, my ancestor, a political refugee from Lisbon, and one of the first Portuguese who landed on these shores, wrote that when he was dying on those mountains which no white foot ever pressed before or since. His name was José da Silvestra, and he lived three hundred years ago. His slave, who waited for him on this side of the mountains, found him dead and brought the writing home to De La Goa. It has been in the family ever since, but none have cared to read it till at last I did, and I have lost my life over it. But another may succeed and become the richest man in the world, the richest man in the world. Only give it to no one, Signor. Go yourself. Then he began to wander again, and in an hour it was all over. God rest him. He died very quietly, and I buried him deep with big boulders on his breast, so I do not think that the jackals can have dug him up. And then I came away. Aye, but the document, said Sir Henry in a tone of deep interest. Yes, the document. What was in it? added the captain. Well, gentlemen, if you like, I will tell you. I have never showed it to anybody yet, except to a drunken old Portuguese trader who translated it for me and had forgotten all about it by the next morning. The original rag is at my home in Durban, together with poor Dom Jose's translation. But I have the English rendering in my pocket book and a facsimile of the map, if it can be called a map. Here it is. I, Jose da Silvestra, who am now dying of hunger in the little cave here. No snow is on the north side of the nipple of the southernmost of the two mountains. I have named Sheba's breasts. Write this in the year 1590, with a cleft bone upon a remnant of my raiment, my blood being the ink. If my slave should find it when he comes, and should bring it to De La Goa, let my friend, name illegible, bring the matters to the knowledge of the king, that he may send an army which, if they live through the desert and the mountains, and can overcome the brave Cucuanes and their devilish arts, to which end many priests should be brought, will make him the richest king since Solomon. With my own eyes I have seen the countless diamonds stored in Solomon's treasure chamber behind the white death. But through the treachery of Gagool, the witch-finder, I may bring naught away, scarcely my life. Let him who comes follow the map, and climb the snow of Sheba's left breast till he reaches the nipple, on the north side of which is the great road Solomon made, from whence three days' journey to the king's palace. Let him kill Gagool. Pray for my soul, 
Farewell, Jose de Silvestra. When I had finished reading the above and shown the copy of the map drawn by the dying hand of the old Dom with his blood for ink, there followed a silence of astonishment. Well, said Captain Good, I have been round the world twice and put in at most ports, but may I be hung for a mutineer if ever I heard a yarn like this out of a story-book, or in it either, for the matter of that. It's a queer tale, Mr. Quatermain, said Sir Henry. I suppose you're not hoaxing us. It is, I know, sometimes thought allowable to take in a greenhorn. If you think that, Sir Henry, I said, much put out in pocketing my paper, for I do not like to be thought one of those silly fellows who consider it witty to tell lies, and who are forever boasting to newcomers of extraordinary hunting adventures which never happened. If you think that, why, there is an end to the matter, and I rose to go. Sir Henry laid his large hand upon my shoulder. Sit down, Mr. Quatermain, he said. I beg your pardon. I see very well that you do not wish to deceive us, but the story sounded so strange that I could hardly believe it. You shall see the original map in writing when we reach Durban, I answered, somewhat mollified. For real, but, I went on, I have not told you about your brother. I knew the man Jim who was with him. He was a Bikuana by birth, a good hunter, and for a native a very clever man. That morning on which Mr. Neville was starting, I saw Jim standing by my wagon and cutting up tobacco on the boom. Jim, said I, where are you off to on this trip? Is it elephants? No, boss, he answered. We are after something much more than ivory. "'And what might that be?' I said, for I was curious. "'Is it gold?' "'No, boss, something worth more than gold,' and he grinned. "'I asked no more questions, for I did not like to lower my dignity by seeming inquisitive, but I was puzzled. "'Presently Jim finished cutting his tobacco. "'Boss,' said he. I took no notice. "'Boss,' said he again. "'Hey, boy, what is it?' I asked. "'Boss, we are going after diamonds.' "'Diamonds? Why, then, you are steering in the wrong direction. You should head for the fields.' "'Boss, have you ever heard of Suleimansburg? "'That is Solomon's Mountains, Sir Henry.' "'Aye. Have you ever heard of the diamonds there?' "'I have heard a foolish story, Jim.' "'It is no story, boss. "'Once I knew a woman who came from there "'and reached Natal with her child. "'She told me. "'She is dead now. "'Your master will feed the Osvogels, "'that is, vultures. "'Jim, if he tries to reach Suleiman's country, "'and so will you if they can get any pickings "'off your worthless old carcass,' said I. "'He grinned. "'Mayhap, boss. "'Man must die.' I'd rather like to try a new country myself. The elephants are getting worked out about. Half an hour after that, I saw Neville's wagon move off. Presently Jim came back running. Goodbye, boss, he said. I didn't like to start without bidding you goodbye, for I dare say you were right, and that we shall never trek south again. Is your master really going to Suleimansburg, Jim, or are you lying? No, he answered. He is going. He told me he was bound to make his fortune somehow, or try to, so he might as well have a fling for the diamonds. Oh, I said, wait a bit, Jim. Will you take a note to your master, Jim, and promise not to give it to him till you reach Inyati, which was some hundred miles off? Yes, boss. So I took a scrap of paper and wrote on it, let him who comes climb the snow of Sheba's left breast till he reaches the nipple, on the north side of which is Solomon's great road. Now, Jim, I said, when you give this to your master, tell him he had better follow the advice on it implicitly. 
"'You are not to give it to him now, "'because I don't want him back asking me questions, "'which I won't answer. "'Now be off, you idle fellow. "'The wagon is nearly out of sight.' "'Jim took the note and went. "'And that is all I know about your brother, Sir Henry. "'But I am much afraid. "'Mr. Quartermain,' said Sir Henry, "'I am going to look for my brother. "'I am going to trace him to Suleiman's Mountains "'and over them, if necessary, till I find him, "'or until I know that he is dead. "'Will you come with me?' "'I am, as I think I have said, a cautious man, "'indeed a timid one, and this suggestion frightened me. It seemed to me that to undertake such a journey would be to go to certain death, and putting other considerations aside, as I had a son to support, I could not afford to die just then. No thank you, Sir Henry. I think I had rather not, I answered. I am too old for wild goose chases of that sort, and we should only end up like my poor friend Silvestre. I have a son dependent on me, so I cannot afford to risk my life foolishly. Both Sir Henry and Captain Good looked very disappointed. Mr. Quartermain, said the former, I am well off, and I am bent upon this business. You may put the remuneration for your services at whatever figure you like in reason, and it shall be paid over to you before we start. Moreover, I will arrange, in the event of anything untoward happening to us or to you, that your son shall be suitably provided for. You will see from this offer how necessary I think your presence. Also, if we by chance should reach this place and find diamonds, they shall belong to you and good equally. I do not want them. But, of course, that promise is worth nothing at all, though the same thing would apply to any ivory we might get. You may pretty well make your own terms with me, Mr. Quartermain, and, of course, I shall pay all expenses. Sir Henry, said I, this is the most liberal proposal I have ever had, and not one to be sneezed at by a poor hunter and trader. But the job is the biggest I have come across and I must take time to think it over. I will give you my answer before we get to Durban. Very good, answered Sir Henry. Then I said good night and turned in, and dreamt about poor long-dead Sylvestra and the diamonds. End of Chapter 2 King Solomon's Mines by H. Ryder Haggard Dedication this faithful but unpretending record of a remarkable adventure is hereby respectfully dedicated by the narrator, Alan Quartermain, to all the big and little boys who read it. Preparer's Note. This was typed from a 1907 edition published by Castle and Company Limited. Author's Note. The author ventures to take this opportunity to thank his readers for the kind reception they have accorded to the successive editions of this tale during the last twelve years. He hopes that in its present form it will fall into the hands of an even wider public, and that in years to come it may continue to afford amusement to those who are still young enough at heart to love a story of treasure, war, and wild adventure. Ditchingham, 11 March, 1898 Postscriptum. Now, in 1907, on the occasion of the issue of this edition, I can only add how glad I am that my romance should continue to please so many readers. Imagination has been verified by fact. The King Solomon's minds I dreamed of have been discovered and are putting out their gold once more. And, according to the latest reports, their diamonds also. The Cucuanas, or rather the Matebele, have been tamed by the white man's bullets, but still there seem to be many who find pleasure in these simple pages. That they may continue to do so even to the third and fourth generation, or perhaps longer still, would, I am sure, be the hope of our old and departed friend, Alan Quartermain. H. Ryder Haggard. Ditchingham, 1907. Introduction. 
Now that this book is printed and about to be given to the world, a sense of its shortcomings both in style and content weighs very heavily upon me. As regards the latter, I can only say that it does not pretend to be a full account of everything we did and saw. There are many things connected with our journey into Kukuwana land that I should have liked to dwell upon at length, which, as it is, have been scarcely alluded to. Amongst these are the curious legends which I collected about the chain armor that saved us from destruction in the great battle of Lu, and also about the silent ones, or colossi, at the mouth of the stalactite cave. Again, if I had given way to my own impulses, I should have wished to go into the differences, some of which are to my mind very suggestive, between the Zulu and Kukuana dialects. Also, a few pages might have been given up profitably to the consideration of the indigenous flora and fauna of Kukuana land. Note, I discovered eight varieties of antelope, with which I was previously totally unacquainted, and many new species of plants, for the most part of the bulbous tribe, A.Q. Then there remains the most interesting subject, that as it is, has only been touched on incidentally, of the magnificent system of military organization in force in that country, which in my opinion is much superior to that inaugurated by Chaka in Zulu land, and as much as it permits of even more rapid mobilization and does not necessitate the employment of the pernicious system of enforced celibacy. Lastly, I have scarcely spoken of the domestic and family customs of the Kukuanas, many of which are exceedingly quaint, or of their proficiency in the art of smelting and welding metals. This science they carry to considerable perfection, of which a good example is to be seen in their tolas, or heavy throwing knives, the backs of these weapons being made of hammered iron and the edges of beautiful steel welded with great skill on the iron frame. The fact of the matter is, I thought, with Sir Henry Curtis and Captain Good, that the best plan would be to tell my story in a plain, straightforward manner, and to leave these matters to be dealt with subsequently in whatever way may ultimately appear to be desirable. In the meanwhile, I shall, of course, be delighted to give all information in my power to anybody interested in such things. And now it only remains for me to offer apologies for my blunt way of writing. I can but say in excuse of it that I am more accustomed to handle a rifle than a pen, and cannot make any pretense to the grand literary flights and flourishes which I see in novels, for sometimes I like to read a novel. I suppose they, the flights and flourishes, are desirable, and I regret not being able to supply them. But at the same time, I cannot help thinking that simple things are always the most impressive and that books are easier to understand when they are written in plain language, though perhaps I have no right to set up an opinion on such a matter. A sharp spear, runs the Kukuana saying, needs no polish. And on the same principle I venture to hope that a true story, however strange it may be, does not require to be decked out in fine words. Alan Quatermain King Solomon's Mines Chapter 1. I Meet Henry Curtis It is a curious thing that at my age, 55, last birthday, I should find myself taking up a pen to try and write a history. I wonder what sort of history it will be when I have finished it, if ever I come to the end of the trip. I have done a good many things in my life, which seems a long one to me, owing to my having begun work so young, perhaps. At an age when other boys are at school, I was earning my living as a trader in the old colony. I have been trading, hunting, fighting, or mining ever since. And yet it is only eight months ago that I made my pile. It is a big pile now that I have got it. I don't yet know how big. But I do not think I would go through the last fifteen or sixteen months again for it. No, not if I knew that I should come out safe at the end, pile and all. But then I am a timid man and dislike violence. Moreover, I am almost sick of adventure. 
I wonder why I am going to write this book. It is not in my line. I am not a literary man, though very devoted to the Old Testament and also to the Ingoldsby legends. Let me try to set down my reasons, just to see if I have any. First reason, because Sir Henry Curtis and Captain John Good asked me. Second reason, because I am laid up here at Durban with the pain in my left leg. Ever since that confounded lion got hold of me, I have been liable to this trouble, and rather bad just now. It makes me limp more than ever. There must be some poison in a lion's teeth. Otherwise, how is it that when your wounds are healed, they break out again? Generally, mark you, at the same time of year that you got your mauling. It is a hard thing when one has shot sixty-five lions or more, as I have in the course of my life, that the sixty-sixth should chew your leg like a quid of tobacco. Breaks the routine of the thing, and putting other considerations aside, I am an orderly man and don't like that. This is, by the way, third reason, because I want my boy Harry, who is over there at the hospital in London studying to become a doctor, to have something to amuse him and keep him out of mischief for a week or so. Hospital work must sometimes pall and grow rather dull, for even of cutting up dead bodies there may come satiety, and as this little history will not be dull, whatever else it may be, it will put a little life into things for a day or two while Harry is reading of our adventures. Fourth reason, and last, because I am going to tell the strangest story that I remember. It may seem a queer thing to say, especially considering there was no woman in it, except for Lata. Stop, though, there is Gogula, if she was a woman and not a fiend. But she was a hundred at least, and therefore not marriageable, so I don't count her. At any rate, I can safely say that there is not a petticoat in the whole history. Well, I had better come to the yoke. It is a stiff place, and I feel as though I were bogged up to the axle. But suchas, suchas, as the Boers say, I'm sure I don't know how they spell it, softly does it. A strong team will come through at last, that is, if they are not too poor. You can never do anything with poor oxen. Now to make a start. I, Alan Quatermain, of Durban, Natal, gentlemen, make oath and say, that's how I headed my deposition before the magistrate about poor Kivas and Ventvogel's sad deaths. But somehow it doesn't seem quite the right way to begin a book. And besides, am I a gentleman? What is a gentleman? I don't quite know. And yet I have had to do with niggers. No, I will scratch out that word niggers, for I do not like it. I have known natives who are... And so you will say, Harry, my boy, before you have done with this tale. And I have known mean whites with lots of money and fresh out from home, too, who are not. At any rate, I was born a gentleman, though I have been nothing but a poor traveling trader and hunter all my life. Whether I have remained so, I know not. You must judge of that. Heaven knows I've tried. I have killed many men in my time, yet I have never slain wantonly or stained my hand in innocent blood, but only in self-defense. The Almighty gave us our lives, and I suppose he meant us to defend them. At least I have always acted on that, and I hope it will not be brought up against me when my clock strikes. There, there, it is a cruel and wicked world, and for a timid man I have been mixed up in a great deal of fighting. I cannot tell the rights of it, but at any rate I have never stolen, though once I cheated a kaffir out of a herd of cattle. But then he had done me a dirty turn, and it has troubled me ever since into the bargain. Well, it is eighteen months or so ago since first I met Sir Henry Curtis and Captain Good. It was in this way. I had been up elephant hunting beyond Bamanguato and had met with bad luck. Everything went wrong that trip and to top up with it, I got the fever badly. So as soon as I was well enough, I trekked down to the diamond fields, sold such ivory as I had, 
together with my wagon and oxen, discharged my hunters and took the postcard to the Cape. After spending a week in Cape Town, finding that they overcharged me at the hotel, and having seen everything there was to see, including the botanical gardens, which seemed to me likely to confer a great benefit on the country, and the new Houses of Parliament, which I expect will do nothing of the sort, I determined to go back to Natal by the Dunkeld, then lying at the docks waiting for the Edinburgh Castle due in from England. I took my berth and went aboard, and that afternoon the Natal passengers from the Edinburgh Castle transhipped, and we weighed and put to sea. Among these passengers who came on board, there were two who excited my curiosity. One, a gentleman of about thirty, was perhaps the biggest chested and longest armed man I ever saw. He had yellow hair, a thick yellow beard, clear-cut features, and large gray eyes set deep in his head. I never saw a finer-looking man, and somehow he reminded me of an ancient dame. Not that I know much of ancient Danes, though I knew a modern Dane who did me out of ten pounds. But I remember once seeing a picture of some of those gentry who they were drinking out of big horns and their long hair hung down their backs. As I looked at my friend standing there by the companion ladder, I thought that if he only let his grow a little, put one of those chain shirts onto his great shoulders, and took hold of a battle axe and a horn mug, he might have sat as a model for that picture. By the way, it is a curious thing, and just shows how the blood will out. I discovered afterwards that Sir Henry Curtis, for that was the big man's name, is of Danish blood. Note. Mr. Quartermain's ideas about ancient Danes seems to be rather confused. We have always understood that they were dark-haired people. Probably he was thinking of Saxons. Editor. He also reminded me strongly of somebody else, but at the time I could not remember who it was. The other man who stood talking to Sir Henry was stout and dark and of quite a different cut. I suspected at once that he was a naval officer. I don't know why, but it is difficult to mistake a navy man. I have gone shooting trips with several of them in the course of my life, and they have always proved themselves the best and bravest and nicest fellows I ever met, though sadly given, some of them, to the use of profane language. I ask a page or two back, what is a gentleman? I'll answer the question now. A royal naval officer is, in a general sort of way, though, of course, there may be a black sheep among them here and there. I fancy it is just the wide seas and the breath of God's winds that wash their hearts and blow the bitterness out of their minds and make them what men ought to be. Well, to return, I proved right again. I ascertained that the dark man was a naval officer, a lieutenant of 31, who after 17 years' service had been turned out of Her Majesty's employ with the barren honor of a commander's rank, because it was impossible that he should be promoted. This is what people who serve the Queen have to expect, to be shot out into the cold world, to find a living, just when they are beginning really to understand their work and to reach the prime of life. I suppose they don't mind it, but for my part I had rather earn my bread as a hunter. One's half pence are as scarce, perhaps, but you do not get so many kicks. The officer's name, I found out, by referring to the passengers' lists, was Good, Captain John Good. He was broad, of medium height, dark, stout, and rather a curious man to look at. He was so very neat and so very clean-shaved, and he always wore an eyeglass in his right eye. It seemed to grow there, for it had no string, and he never took it out except to wipe it. At first I thought he used to sleep in it, but afterwards I found that this was a mistake. He put it in his trouser pocket when he went to bed, together with his false teeth, of which he had two beautiful sets, that, my own being none of the best, have often caused me to break the Tenth Commandment. But I am anticipating. Soon after we had got under way, evening closed in, 
and brought with it very dirty weather. A keen breeze sprung up off the land, and a kind of aggravated scotch mist soon drove everybody from the deck. As for the Dunkeld, she is a flat-bottom punt, and going up light as she was, she rolled very heavily. It almost seemed as though she would go right over, but she never did. It was quite impossible to walk about, so I stood near the engines where it was warm, and amused myself with watching the pendulum which was fixed opposite to me, swinging slowly backwards and forwards as the vessel rolled, and marking the angle she touched. "'That pendulum's wrong. It is not properly weighted,' suddenly said a somewhat testy voice at my shoulder. Looking round, I saw the naval officer whom I had noticed when the passengers came aboard. "'Indeed, what makes you think so?' I asked. "'Think so? I don't think at all. Why, there,' as she righted herself after a roll. "'If the ship had really rolled to the degree that thing pointed to, then she never would have rolled again, that's all.' "'But it is just like these merchant skippers. "'They are always so confoundedly careless. "'Just then the dinner-bell rang, and I was not sorry, "'for it is a dreadful thing to have to listen to an officer of the Royal Navy "'when he gets on to that subject. "'I only know one worse thing, and that is to hear a merchant skipper "'express his candid opinion of officers of the Royal Navy. "'Captain Good and I went down to dinner together, "'and there we found Sir Henry Curtis already seated.' He and Captain Good were placed together, and I sat opposite to them. The captain and I soon fell into talk about shooting and what not, he asking me many questions, for he is very inquisitive about all sorts of things, and I answering them as well as I could. Presently he got on to elephants. "'Ah, sir,' called out somebody who was sitting near me, "'you've reached the right man for that.' Hunter Quartermain should be able to tell you about elephants if anybody can. Sir Henry, who had been sitting quite quiet listening to our talk, startled visibly. Excuse me, sir, he said, leaning forward across the table and speaking in a low, deep voice, a very suitable voice, it seemed to me, to come out of those great lungs. Excuse me, sir, but is your name Alan Quartermain? I said that it was. The big man made no further remark, but I heard him mutter fortunate into his beard. Presently dinner came to an end, and as we were leaving the saloon, Sir Henry strolled up and asked me if I would come into his cabin to smoke a pipe. I accepted, and he led the way to the Dunkel deck cabin, and a very good cabin it is. It had been two cabins, but when Sir Garnet Wolseley, or one of those big swells, went down the coast in the Dunkeld, they knocked away the partition and have never put it up again. There was a sofa in the cabin and a little table in front of it. Sir Henry sent the steward for a bottle of whiskey, and the three of us sat down and lit our pipes. "'Mr. Quartermain,' said Sir Henry Curtis, when the man had brought the whiskey and lit the lamp, the year before last, about this time, you were, I believe, at a place called Bamanguato, to the north of the Transvaal. I was, I answered, rather surprised that this gentleman should be so well acquainted with my movements, which were not, so far as I was aware, considered of general interest. You were trading up there, were you not? put in Captain Good in his quick way. I was. I took a wagon load of goods made a camp outside the settlement, and stopped till I had sold them. Sir Henry was sitting opposite to me in a Madeira chair, his arms leaning on the table. He now looked up, fixing his large gray eyes full upon my face. There was a curious anxiety in them, I thought. Did you happen to meet a man called Neville there? Oh, yes, he outspanned alongside of me for a fortnight to rest his oxen, before going on to the interior. I had a letter from a lawyer a few months back asking me if I knew what had become of him, which I answered to the best of my ability at the time. Yes, said Sir Henry, your letter was forwarded to me. You said in it that the gentleman called Neville left Bamanguato at the beginning of May in a wagon with his driver, a voorlooper, and a kaffir hunter called Jim. 
announcing his intention of trekking, if possible, as far as Inyati, the extreme trading post in the Matabele country, where he would sell his oxen and proceed on foot. You also said that he did sell his wagon, for six months afterwards you saw the wagon in the possession of a Portuguese trader, who told you that he had bought it at Inyati from a white man whose name he had forgotten and that he believed the white man with the native servant had started off for the interior on a shooting trip. Yes. Then came a pause. Mr. Quartermain, said Sir Henry suddenly, I suppose you know or can guess nothing more of the reasons of my, of Mr. Neville's journey to the northward, or as to what point that journey was directed. I heard something, I answered, and stopped. The subject was one which I did not care to discuss. Sir Henry and Captain Good looked at each other, and Captain Good nodded. Mr. Quartermain went on the former. I am going to tell you a story and ask your advice, and perhaps your assistance. The agent who forwarded me your letter told me that I might rely on it implicitly, as you were, he said, well known and universally respected in Natal, and especially noted for your discretion. I bowed and drank some whiskey and water to hide my confusion, for I am a modest man, and Sir Henry went on. Mr. Neville was my brother. Oh, I said, starting, for now I knew of whom Sir Henry had reminded me when first I saw him. His brother was a much smaller man and had a dark beard, but now that I thought of it, he possessed eyes of the same shade of gray and with the same keen look in them. The features, too, were not unlike... He was, went on Sir Henry, my only and younger brother, until five years ago, I do not suppose that we were ever a month away from each other. But just about five years ago, a misfortune befell us, as sometimes does happen in families. We quarreled bitterly, and I behaved unjustly to my brother in my anger. Here Captain Good nodded his head vigorously to himself. The ship gave a big roll just then, so that the looking-glass, which was fixed opposite us to starboard, was for a moment nearly over our heads, and as I was sitting with my hands in my pockets and staring upwards, I could see him nodding like anything. "'As I dare say you know,' went on Sir Henry, "'if a man dies intestate and has no property but land, real property is called in England, it all descends to his eldest son.' It so happened that just at the time when we quarreled, our father died intestate. He had put off making his will until it was too late. The result was that my brother, who had not been brought up to any profession, was left without a penny. Of course, it would have been my duty to provide for him, but at the time the quarrel between us was so bitter that I did not, to my shame, I say it, and he sighed deeply offer to do anything. It was not that I grudged him justice, but I waited for him to make advances, and he made none. I am sorry to trouble you with all this, Mr. Quartermain, but I must make things clear. Eh, good? Quite so, quite so, said the captain. Mr. Quartermain will, I am sure, keep this history to himself. Of course, said I for I rather pride myself on my discretion, for which, as Sir Henry had heard, I have some repute. Well, went on Sir Henry, my brother had a few hundred pounds to his account at the time. Without saying anything to me, he drew out this paltry sum, and having adopted the name of Neville, started off for South Africa in the wild hope of making a fortune. This I learned afterwards. Some three years passed, and I heard nothing of my brother, though I wrote several times. Doubtless the letters never reached him. But as time went on, I grew more and more troubled about him. I found out, Mr. Quartermain, that blood is thicker than water. That's true, said I, thinking of my boy Harry. I found out, Mr. Quartermain, that I would have given half my fortune to know that my brother George, the only relation I possess, was safe and well, and that I should see him again. 
"'But you never did, Curtis,' jerked out Captain Good, glancing at the big man's face. "'Well, Mr. Quartermain, as time went on, I became more and more anxious to find out if my brother was alive or dead, and if alive, to get him home again. I set inquiries on foot, and your letter was one of the results.' So far as it went, it was satisfactory, for it showed that till lately George was alive, but it did not go far enough. So, to cut a long story short, I made up my mind to come out and look for him myself, and Captain Good was so kind as to come with me. Yes, said the captain, nothing else to do, you see. Turned out by my lords of the Admiralty to starve on half pay. "'And now, perhaps, sir, you will tell us what you know "'or have heard of the gentleman called Neville.'" End of chapter 1